Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to open the talk um, the, by, by um, addressing the question that had been put to me uh, in preparation for the seminar in, at Oxford. And it had to do with um, Ibn Arabi's relevance to our situation today. And uh, no matter uh, which of his books you pick up and start to read, you immediately see um, that he wants for everyone that they should have a direct experience of spirituality and what that actually means. And at the same time, uh, he was truly an iconoclast, um, a supreme iconoclast of his day. And that's part of what made him so despised, as well as so controversial. But consider, given what has happened in the last few weeks, consider what he has to say about conviction. Because as we go into the talk, um, which is about the, really about the imago dei, the divine image, the, the human being as the divine image, um, a path and a realization shared by all of the religious traditions. Uh, and today we're going to hear his explanation of that. But prior to that, consider what the background was, the resistance in some circles to this kind of idea and, and what he had to contend with. Um, so that by the 15th century, um, his teachings were very well established, and they had been um, deeply criticized, demonized. He had been characterized as a madman who had gone crazy doing too many spiritual exercises. Um, he was characterized as somebody who was informed by Satan, and that if anybody even read his works, they too would be hellbound. You see, so this is the kind of person we're we're dealing with. And we have to say, well, why was he so threatening? What was so threatening about his teachings? And on the issue of um, religious fanaticism and his wish to deconstruct fanaticism, um, we have the citation from Shu'aib. Um, the only difference between the gods created from conviction and carved idols that are worshipped by idolaters is that carved idols are fashioned in this outer world and the gods of conviction are internally manufactured through supposition. Or consider the Central Asian Khwarazmi who was teaching at Herat um, in the 15th, 16th century, who is uh, here giving his elucidation on similar words from Hood. The believer, we would say today the true believer, a term often referring to the fanatic, the believer who is veiled from seeing reality and who has limited God to the form of his own conviction, does not actually believe in anything except the divinity of his own fantasy and mental fabrication. Yet the supreme essence abides beyond limitation and definition, even while it appears in all the forms of existence in conformity with the eternal divine attributes. Therefore, whoever attempts to restrict what is beyond limitation and who rejects any conception of divinity other than his own has only the God he has fabricated as the God of his conviction. So there's no difference between the carved idols worshipped as deities by idolaters and the gods fabricated in the constricted minds of those veiled from true reality. 
Well, we see very many um, observations of this kind that we would have to call uh, psychological using, using theological language. And it strikes me that this kind of material is, is what we need to see um, translated and spread into the Islamic world in particular um, for people to consider. Um, his greatest critic um, was Ibn Taymiyyah. When the Jordanian pilot was burned to death, uh, the words of Ibn Taymiyyah were quoted below in Arabic. Um, for those, for any of you who happened to see the video, you would see there was a fatwa by Ibn Taymiyyah, and it was quoted below as, a, as the rationale for burning the Jordanian pilot to death in that cage, for any of you who might have been aware of that. Anyway, I'm sorry to start on this sad note, but we have to keep some sadness in our hearts so that we could um, console internally those people who lost their loved ones. And, um, but on a happier note, what he was stressing, of course, was the path of spiritual experience and the, the amazingly optimistic and lovely idea of the Imago Dei, you know, the divine image, shared by all of the great traditions, even in, say, in Buddhism, the original mind. Huh? So, so we have uh, the talk I'm giving is a, each time I give this talk, um, Waking to the Embrace, you may have already seen it on YouTube, and you might see this one on YouTube as well. But each time I'm changing the talk a little bit, just so you know. But more importantly, uh, hopefully there's a question answer session that gives us time to discuss some of these ideas. But frankly, under that title, um, uh, one, and perhaps I could talk for, for weeks and weeks uh, about the Sheikh's ideas about embodiment and, um, and, and waking to the the reality of that embodiment in each of us. Huh? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the compassionate and the merciful. The human being as God's mirror. The human being as the sacred ground for God's self-knowing. The human being as the embodiment of the divine attributes. These ideas had been circulating in the Islamic world for several centuries before Ibn Arabi's birth. We encounter them in the seemingly blasphemous words of Mansur al-Halaj, in the godly identity of Attar's 30 birds, and in the reflected colored lights of Najmuddin Kubra's spiritual visions. Variations on the doctrine of the human being serving as the instrument of God's self-knowing can be found in the spiritual literature of several of the world's religions. Yet it would not be unfair to say that Ibn Arabi's teachings about humanity's instrumental role in God's self-knowing are far more inclusive of the diversity of human experience than anything previously written. Even the Sheikh's spiritual heirs appear hesitant to embrace the far-reaching implications of his ideas. What makes Ibn Arabi's message so relevant to our own lives is precisely his insistence that all of human experience is divine self-expression. Ibn Arabi emphasized that God's presence can be witnessed anywhere along the continuum of human experience, in the body, in thought, feelings, and the imagination, as well as in various states of enhanced awareness. Historically, many of the spiritual traditions of the world taught that enlightenment or knowing God is only attained by completely transcending the experiences of the senses, the imagination, and thought. 
dualistic traditions have described the world as fundamentally unreal, a mirage unrelated to true reality. A recurring theme in Ibn Arabi's writings is the importance of knowing the divine reality as both transcendent and imminent. He taught that spiritual maturity lies in the integration of both perspectives, witnessing God's transcendence by detaching from the senses and experiencing God's presence in the body and the mind. He states this plainly enough in the opening chapter of the Fusus al Hikam. Quote from Austin for clarity and simplicity's sake. The reality has described himself as being the outer and the inner, manifest and unmanifest. He brought the cosmos into being as constituting an unseen realm and a sensory realm so that we might perceive the inner through our unseen and the outer through our sensory aspect." Unquote. Al Zahir, the manifest, and Al Batan, the unmanifest, are two of God's names. Lists of the divine names, usually numbering 99, are drawn from God's self-described qualities in the Quran. The divine names span the poles of Tanzi, transcendence, and Tashbi, comparability and imminence. Ibn Arabi's masterpiece, the Fusus al-Hikam, opens with a statement about, humanity, about the human being's comprehensive capacity to reflect all of the divine names. He writes that Adam is called human and son because of the universality of his formation and because he embraces all of the realities." Unquote. The realities that the Sheikh is referring to are the potentials of the divine names. In his opening lines, he describes the human capacity to reflect God's own comprehensiveness. Quote, the reality wanted to see the essences of his most beautiful names, or to put it another way, to see his own essence in an all-inclusive object encompassing the whole command, which qualified by existence would reveal to him his own mystery." Unquote. In this opening statement, Ibn Arabi captures our essential relationship to God and the instrumental role of our existence in God's self-knowing. He goes on to explain that the angels rejected Adam because they were limited to glorifying God's transcendence. It was their ignorance about the comprehensive scope of the divine names, he writes, that led the angels to misjudge Adam. Implied in this discourse is the Sheikh's challenge to the transcendentalist mindset prevalent among the theologians of his day. Most Muslims, in truth, possess some awareness of God's imminence because of the personal nature of God's communication in the scripture, and because of the intimacy that they felt in worship. But the theologians emphasize God's incomparability and transcendence. They held that only the prophets had been able to commune with God. Reverence and the fear of God were stressed and to obediently follow his commands. Ibn Arabi draws his reader's attention to a pattern in the Quran of alternating revelations about God's transcendence and imminence. There are verses that invite the intellect to ponder and intuit God's incomparability, while other verses engage the imagination with similes describing God's imminent presence around us and within us. The emphasis on God's transcendence by the theologians and many of the Sufis of his time 
compelled the Sheikh to challenge their views, occasionally with strong language. In the wisdom of Noah, he writes, quote, For those who truly know the divine realities, the doctrine of transcendence imposes a restriction and a limitation on true reality. For he who asserts that God is purely transcendent is a fool or a rogue, even if he be a professed believer. For if he maintains that God is purely transcendent and excludes all other considerations, he acts mischievously and misrepresents the reality and all of the apostles, albeit unwittingly. The truth is that the reality is manifest in every created being and in every concept. While he is at the same time hidden from all understanding, except for whoever holds that the cosmos is his form and his identity. This is the name, the manifest, while he is also the unmanifested spirit, the unmanifest, unquote. The emphasis on God's transcendence had spiritual and psychological consequences. Mainstream believers were cautious, even fearful, of aspiring to any intimate communion with God. They imitated the sayings and behaviors of their religious leaders and carefully performed the established rituals of worship. Their religious personas struggled with instinct and imagination, both of which they regarded as Satan's playgrounds. Internalized transcendentalist teachings made people fearful of their own thoughts and feelings. They became judgmental of themselves and projected this onto others. Most of the mullahs rejected the possibility of intimately knowing God. So the believers' energies and emotions found their expression in religious conviction. More often than not, conviction led to absolutism with all of the hazards associated with insisting that there is only one truth. The Sheikh encouraged people to consider the many citations in the scripture about God's presence in the world and in themselves. At the very least, he hoped that people would regard what occurred in the world and in themselves as guiding signs from God. He wrote, quote, it is clear that God draws our attention to what is originated as an aid to knowledge of him. And he says that he will show forth his signs in it. Thus he suggests that knowledge of him is inferred in knowledge of ourselves." Unquote. The Sheikh is here quoting the Quran which states, we will show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves until it is clear to them that he is the true reality. Repeating this verse in the wisdom of Noah, he adds an insightful statement about how, how our own experience is related to divine consciousness. Quote, for you are to God just as your physical form is to you. And he is to you like the guiding spirit is to your corporeal form. For you are to God just as your physical form is to you. And he is to you like the guiding spirit is to your corporeal form." Unquote. I think a lot about this statement because it keeps me mindful of God's presence in my own experience. That whatever I experience, however trivial or profound, is always the embodiment of one or another of the divine names. The Sheikh's words 
beckon us to a path of intimacy, of seeking God within ourselves. In all of our changing states, this is the path that God invites us to with his words. He is with you wherever you are. To the extent that we can experience God's presence in our thoughts, feelings, fantasies, and sensations, we will witness the embrace of his qualities, however attenuated their manifestation might appear in our limited nature. In the wisdom of Abraham, Ibn Arabi states, quote, Do you not understand that the reality is manifest through the attributes of relative beings. When he has informed us of that himself, even through attributes of deficiency and blame, do you not understand that the created being is manifest through the attributes of the reality? From the first to the last, all of them being appropriate to it, even as the attributes of created beings are appropriate to the reality." Unquote. Statements like this caused an uproar among the theologians. Many of them turned against Ibn Arabi and accused him of blasphemy. Even among those identifying themselves as Sufis, there were many who rejected all, if not portions, of the Sheikh's teachings about God's imminence. The religious doctrine of God's transcendence had its counterpart in the field of spirituality. Self-transcendence was practiced by Muslim mystics hoping to experience God's presence, abandoning the world, constant struggle with the ego self, and disengagement from the senses. These became the recommended practices. The Sufis of the period stressed that it was only through self-denial and effacement that God could be known. Ibn Arabi certain agreed, certainly agreed with this view up to a point. He endorsed effacement and self-transcendence as the means of escaping ego identification in order to witness one's essential relationship to God. He taught that by dissociating from the senses and withdrawing from the ego self, the Gnostic could discover the unborn source of his or her own individuality. About such Gnostics, he writes in the wisdom of Seth, quote, they have made themselves ever ready to receive whatever comes from God and have withdrawn completely from their separatist selves and their aims. Of these persons, there are those who know that God's knowledge of them in all of their states corresponds to what they themselves are in their state of pre-existent latency. They know that the reality will bestow on them only that which their latent essences contribute to him." Unquote. Ibn Arabi wrote extensively about the self-transcendence known in Sufism as fana, the annihilation of the self. In most of Sufi literature, self-annihilation means to lose all awareness of oneself. Many writers have described fana as the objective of the spiritual path. Countering this view in the Mawakhe, the Sheikh writes, William Chittick's translation, quote, true perfection is found only in the one who witnesses both his Lord and himself. If someone were to witness his Lord while being completely free of witnessing himself, as some people have claimed, he would gain no benefit and be the possessor of imperfection. For then the real would be the one who witnesses himself through himself. And that is the way things are in any case. So what benefit would accrue to the one who supposes that he was annihilated from himself and witness his Lord at the same time?" Unquote. 
The Sheikh generally associated self-transcendence with the disappearance of duality. Fana was for him the ultimate purification of the self, which would render it receptive to theophanies at the deepest level of personal awareness. He stated that genuine effacement should result in the enhancement of mental and perceptive faculties. Quote, also from Chittick's translation. There is no instance of witnessing without a trace in the one who witnesses it. The trace is what is called the witness. It brings about the increase that accrues to the rational and other faculties. If this witness is not found after the annihilation, then it was not an annihilation in Tawheed unity. On the contrary, it was a sleep of the heart, since in our view, annihilation is of two sorts. When we find the witness after it, then it is correct. When we do not find the witness after it, we call it the sleep of the heart. It is like someone who sleeps and does not dream." Unquote. Throughout his writings, the Sheikh described self-effacement as a prelude to the appearance of theophanies in the mirror of the heart. One of his finest explanations about the receptive scope of the mystic's heart is to be found in the wisdom of Shu'aib in the Fusus, which is perhaps why this chapter became required reading in some Sufi circles. The Sheikh opens this chapter by referencing God's statement that he is only embraced by the attuned and enabled heart. The Hadith states, I am not embraced by my earth, nor by my heavens, yet I am embraced by the heart of my servant, the faithful. The faithful Al-Mumin is one of several divine names which God has attributed both to himself and to human beings. The Arabic word root for the ideas of embracing and of having capacity is wusa. Its numerology adds to 136, equivalent to that of Mumin, faithful. This linkage helps us to grasp God's stipulation that it is only his faithful servant, one with receptive capacity and attunement, who can embrace him. Just as God embraces his own image in the human mirror, the human being's core awareness, called the heart, has the capacity to embrace God according to the divine statement. The wisdom of Shu'aib explores this hadith as it applies to the whole range of human experience. The hadith is important enough to the Sheikh that he ends the Fusus al-Hikam, the jewel of his legacy, by again quoting it. At the beginning of the Fusus, the Sheikh makes a more general statement about God embracing his own qualities in the comprehensive human form. There he cites a tradition originating in the Jewish scripture that God created Adam according to his own image. Since the divine essence is deemed absolutely beyond formal manifestation, we may take it that these words refer to God's names and qualities. The wisdom of Shu'aib deserves careful, detailed study. Here I will just quote a few statements about the divine human embrace in its manifestation at different levels of transcendence and imminence. About the impossibility of our sense perceptions grasping God's absolute transcendence, Ibn Arabi writes, quote, Austin again, on this question, Junaid has said, when the contingent is linked with the eternal, there is nothing left of it. Thus, when the heart embraces the eternal one, 
how can it possibly be aware of what is contingent and created, unquote. Here again, he points to self-effacement as a purification, in this case of any consciousness of one's contingent mortal existence. The Sheikh next describes how the heart is enabled to receive the theophanies of the divine names. He explains that the enabled heart necessarily conforms to the particular character of each divine self-manifestation. Since, quote, since the self-manifestation of the reality is variable, according to the variety of the forms, the heart is necessarily wide or restricted according to the form in which God manifests himself. The heart can comprise no more than the form in which the self-manifestation occurs. For the heart of the Gnostic, or the perfect man, is as the setting of the stone of the ring, conforming to it in every way." Unquote. In the following lines, Ibn Arabi writes about the origins of these theophanies at the most obscure, transcendental level of divine manifestation prior to their appearance within the enabled heart, which is the interface bridging transcendence and imminence. Quote, God manifests himself in two ways, an unseen manifestation and a sensible witnessed manifestation. It is from the former type that the predisposition of the heart is bestowed, being the essential self-manifestation, the very nature of which is to be unseen." Unquote. When the predisposition comes to the heart, there then manifests to it the sensible manifestation in the sensible world, he adds. The Sheikh is being as clear as he can about the obscure, transcendental origins of personal spiritual events and the manner in which they are experienced in the heart, the core of human awareness. Commentators on this chapter write that spiritual preparedness is bestowed on the heart at the level of the most sacred effusion, the Fayd al-Aqdas. The mystic then witnesses the theophanies at the level of the sacred effusion, the Fayd al-Muqaddas. The divine names, which are mere potentials at the level of the most sacred effusion, manifest at the next level in the enabled heart. The Sheikh then switches the perspective to the human side, where he describes the process of spiritual unfolding from the level of imminence. He quotes one of the most significant hadiths about Islamic spirituality, which states, quote, my servant persists in approaching me with an excess of devotion until I love him or her. When I love him, I become his hearing by which he hears, his seeing by which he sees, his tongue with which he speaks, his hand with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks." Unquote. It is the servant's sincere expression of worship and devotion that is answered with God's infinite love. God reciprocates the servant's intense devotion with the intensification of his imminent presence in the servant's body and perceptive faculties. God's love saturates the, surgeon, the servant's perceptive and sensory faculties which are immeasurably enhanced by the divine awareness. In the following lines, the Sheikh describes the integration of transcendence and imminence. Quote, when you consider God saying, I am his foot with which he walks, his hand with which he strikes, and his tongue with which he speaks, and all the other faculties and members in which they are situated, why do you make the distinction by saying it is all the reality? Or it is all created? It is all created in a certain sense, but it is also the reality in another sense, the essence being one. After all, in essence, the form of a self-manifestation 
and that of the one who perceives it are the same. For he is at once the self-manifesting subject and the object of that manifestation. Consider then how wonderful is God in his identity and in his relation to the cosmos in the realities inherent in the beautiful names." Unquote. Ibn Arabi adds this poem. Who is here and what there? Who is here is what is there. He who is universal is particular. And he who is particular is universal. There is but one essence, the light of the essence being also darkness. Whoever heeds these words will not fall into confusion. In truth, only he knows what we say who is possessed of Hema. Now, Austin has translated the word Hema as spiritual power, which it certainly means. Yet in the Quran, in the Surah Yusuf, for example, we find the verbal form of Hema to mean loving and wanting. So in addition to the idea of spiritual power, we can take Hema to mean a loving and passionate resolve, which better fits the poem inspired by the Hadith quoted by the Sheikh on knowing God through devotion and love. The Hadith, I am not embraced by my earth nor by my heavens, yet I am embraced by the heart of my faithful servant, describes a heart that embraces the levels of transcendence and imminence intrinsic to the divine names. God calls the heart faithful, meaning truly receptive to the divine realities. In the Quran, God tells the servant to bring him a sound, whole heart. Elsewhere, God describes the spiritual incapacity of those whose hearts are sick. In the verse, surely in that is a reminder for the one who has a heart, it is implied that only a heart that is receptive to the divine reminders can truly be called a heart. In the ongoing discourse on the wisdom of Shu'aib, the Sheikh extends the meaning of this verse to include the idea of the heart's adaptive receptivity. In the Quranic context, surely in that is a reminder for whoever has a heart refers to God's destruction of past civilizations for their evil and rebellion. Yet the Sheikh often interprets the scripture in a much broader manner to support his insights. He writes, surely in that is a reminder for whoever has a heart by reason of God's transformation through all the varieties of forms and attributes." Unquote. The Sheikh explains that the heart has undergone a fundamental transformation that keeps it adaptive to God's ever-changing self-manifestations. Through its changing states and experiences, the heart will remain conscious of God's presence in this world and also in the hereafter. Quote, for the Gnostic, the reality is known and not denied. Those who know in this world will know in the hereafter. For this reason, God says, for one who is possessed of a heart, namely one who understands the formal transformations of the reality by adapting himself or herself formally so that from himself he knows the divine self. God is the one who knows, the one who understands and affirms in this particular form, just as he is also the ignorant one, the uncomprehending, the, un the unknown in that particular form." Unquote. According to the Sheikh, absolutism, dogmatism, and narrow-mindedness are all undermined by the vastness of the heart's perspective. Conviction is dissolved in the direct experience of God's unity, which shines through the numerous veils 
of all of our states and forms. Except for this, he writes, people will remain trapped in their own projections and mental fabrications about themselves and true reality. In the wisdom of Hood, he writes, quote, in general, most people have perforce an individual concept of their Lord, which they ascribe to him and in which they seek him. So long as the reality is presented to them, according to it, they recognize him and affirm him. Whereas if presented in any other form, they deny him, flee from him and treat him improperly, while at the same time imagining that they are acting towards him fittingly. One who believes, believes only in a deity he has created in himself. Since a deity in conviction is a mental construction, they see in what they believe only themselves and their own constructions within themselves." Unquote. Perhaps the most shocking to some and delightful to others of the Sheikh's discourses about God's imminence is say for the last chapter of the Fusus, the wisdom of Muhammad, peace be upon him. As pointed out earlier, transcendentalism dominated the theology of Ibn Arabi's day and strongly informed mystical doctrine and praxis as well. Most of the Sufis cultivated self-transcendence. Their writings describe witnessing God's overwhelming presence during times of utter passivity and self-effacement. Ibn Arabi acknowledged their attainment, but regarded it as incomplete. Perfection, he wrote, was to witness in oneself God's active and passive self-expressions in the world. Muhammad, according to Ibn Arabi, was the seal of prophecy because he embodied all of the divine names. The chapter on Muhammad is organized around a well-known hadith in which the prophet speaking to God says, quote, three things have been made beloved to me in your world, women and perfume, and the joy of my eyes is in the prayer, unquote. The hadith which bridges the levels of imminence and transcendence clearly inform the Sheikh's own comprehensive approach to spirituality. Women were made beloved to Muhammad, he explains, because the enlightened, enabled heart witnesses God most completely during the sexual embrace. He writes, quote, when man contemplates the reality in woman, he beholds God in a passive aspect, while when he contemplates God in himself as being that from which woman is manifest, he beholds him in an active aspect. When, however, he contemplates him only in himself, he beholds God as passive to the divine self directly. His contemplation of the reality in woman is the most complete and perfect because in this way he contemplates the reality in both the active and passive mode, while by contemplating the reality only in himself, he beholds God in a passive mode particularly." Unquote. As a shorthand for his spiritual path, the Sheikh would quote the famous saying of the prophets, peace be upon him, which states, quote, whoever knows himself or herself knows their Lord, unquote. Ibn Arabi's approach was always informed by the prophet's fusion of spiritual and worldly experience. The Sheikh emphasized the need to integrate the outer and the inner, the seen and the unseen, the transcendent and the imminent. He wrote that we can embrace God's imminent presence because we are ever in the embrace of the divine names. He taught that everything that exists is an embodiment of what is latent in the divine names and the essences of things. All entities are bodies, whether spiritual, imaginal, mental, or physical. 
It is by deepening our awareness of the different levels of embodiment that we can more fully witness the divine reality. Ibn Arabi's spiritual path can be put into practice at any time, in any situation, and in any state. For our hectic and complex world, it would be hard to find a more coherent approach. I think the Sheikh would have greatly appreciated the ideals of our modern pluralistic civilization. Because what we mean by pluralism at its best is the harmonious joining of a great many ways of life and points of view, an ethic at the heart of the Sheikh's teachings. I think he would have really appreciated the opportunities and hazards of our situation. Thank you. <laughs>